Hi, I'm Dean Spade. I'm really grateful to be invited to be included in this gathering. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you all in person, um, and I hope that this video is a useful contribution to your conversation. Um, thanks so much to the organizers for sending me some background information about your work and the context you're doing it in, and also um, for sending me great questions. So I'm going to try to answer as many of them as I can. Um, so they asked me to introduce myself. Um, I live in Seattle in the United States. Um, I work as a law professor now. Um, I've been a poverty lawyer a lot of my life. Um, I founded an organization in 2002 called the Sylvia Rivera Law Project that's based in New York City um, that provides free legal help to low-income trans people and trans people of color and is really focused on trying to build a trans movement that's based in racial and economic justice. Um, that's connected to some themes I'm going to be talking about. Um, I guess more broadly, I came of age in the United States as a queer and trans person during what we might see as like a mainstreaming of gay and lesbian politics, and now to some degree trans politics, um, sort of during a period where that politics became increasingly conservative um, and folded into particular state interests. So um, one way we talk about this is that like, in the period of the 1960s and 70s, there was a queer and trans emerging politics that was part of a broader, you know, national and global set of uprisings against white supremacy, colonialism, um, uh, sexism and patriarchy. And a lot of the queer politics of that time was very anti-police. We kind of think of the famous Stonewall uprising, the moments when queer and trans people fought back against cops. Um, and a lot of people who were in that movement were also part of organizations like the Young Lords that was working for Puerto Rican resistance and for Puerto Rican decolonization um, or the Black Panther Party. There were a lot of um, overlaps between the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam and um, the uh, context of LGBT activism. Um, and what happened is that over the, as kind of that period of, of a lot of pretty revolutionary activism in the United States began to come to a close, um, there was a huge, um, that happened because there was a huge backlash against that kind of work in the US and the government really targeted revolutionary anti-racist and anti-war groups. And, um, and we saw the rise of kind of the Ronald Reagan era, the conservatization of United States politics, um, attacks and limits on domestic activists, you know, growing neoliberal economic policies and in a lot of movements, including in the LGBT movement, the rise of a conservative version of that movement. So that in the U.S. that looked like a new gay and lesbian rights framework that centered white people, that centered upper class people, and had as its demands same-sex marriage, um, the ability to, to fight in the U.S. military, um, anti-discrimination laws, and hate crime laws. Those became like the new platform. So it went from being a movement that in many ways was anti-police to being a movement that was very pro-police that said, we want to be able to call the police when we are in danger and we want to like create a good relationship between the police and um, LGBT people, which of course really means white LGBT people because that's who feels like the police are a source of safety and not violence in the US. Um, it went from being a movement that had a critique that was, you know, based in um, in uh, an anti-sexist feminist um, critiques, um, which you know have really ex you know exposed marriage as a site of um, of control of of women and children, and a site of um, you know uh, consolidating private property arrangements, and as a racist and colonial institution in the U.S. It went from having that critique to saying we want to get married, we want to be like straight people. We want to have weddings. And it became a very kind of upper class fantasy about straight, about gay people having the same kinds of property relationships that straight people have through marriage, which, you know, in the U S the way that's structured, those things really benefit you. If you have more money, if you have immigration status, if you have healthcare through your job, they don't really do much for poor people. Um, it went from being a movement that was connected to anti-war, um, anti-war uprising and anti-war protest to being a movement that said, let us serve in the military. The U.S. military is such an important job. We want to be part of it. So it was a really big shift um, from the kind of um, LGBT politics that um, we see in the Stonewall uprising moment to the kind that became like sort of the common sense 
of the United States. Um, so part of what that does, part of what happened is that um, LGBT leaders and organizations that were part of these sort of this new wave of NGOs, um, they shaped an agenda that actually really collaborates with the very institutions in the U.S. government that um, and culture that um, left left wing movements had most been resisting: marriage, the military, the police. Um, it went from um, it, it became a movement that actually, in some ways, provides cover for those systems or strengthens them by allowing them to say they've included us. Um, and so that context is how I is the, the is the period I've lived in right the last 20 years that I've been doing queer and trans activism has been a period where I've been involved with left-wing groups who are trying to push back on that agenda and actually keep articulating a queer and trans liberation agenda centered in opposition to U.S. militarism opposition to marriage and all forms of um you know of of uh capitalist private property arrangements that keep rich people rich and keep poor people poor and keep women and children under the control of men and all of that stuff. Um, opposition to labor arrangements that are exploitative, right? We, we're trying to talk about an anti-capitalist queer and trans movement. Um, opposition to policing and prisons, which is really vital in the United States since we're the most imprisoning country in the world. Um, so one of the things that happened, you know, that I think uh, has kept this common sense in place and has been I see this common sense, not just in the United States, but I see this reproduced around the world, is the idea that if you just get people protected by law, like if you get sexual orientation and gender identity included in anti-discrimination measures or anti-hate crime measures, somehow we will be safe. And this is a real dilemma for social movements because you know, in the United States, it's a huge dilemma because we've seen that in the last 50 years or so, we saw a lot of things change in the United States law, right? Like we went from having an apartheid system with, you know, Jim Crow segregation to saying racism is illegal, you know, in the law. We went, uh, we, you know, we got laws against disability discrimination. We got laws against sexism. But those conditions all maintained the same or, or became worse during that same period. So now supposedly we're all, all protected by law, but the United States has seen a worsening wealth divide in that time, worsening income gaps. We've seen people have to work more and have more precarious lives. We've seen a growing militarization of our border and more people imprisoned for being immigrants than ever before. We've seen a drastic expansion of our prison system, right? The United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. All of that happened while supposedly people of color, women, people with disabilities all supposedly got more protected by law. So there's a real gap between what the law says about what's happening in our lives and the material conditions. And that means that social movements have to be figuring out like how to how to do how to assess this, how to figure out whether something is actually a beneficial reform or whether it's a reform that happens on paper but doesn't actually happen in our lives. Um, so, um, a few questions emerge. One question that's vital for us is how to engage with law and legal reform, given that we know this. It's not as if we can just stop engaging with laws and legal systems because, of course, people in our communities are criminalized, people in our communities are facing immigration, um, consequences people are like legal systems are in our lives so we can't just ignore law but how should we engage with law if it's not just to say "Ooh, if it says nice things about us then our lives will change since that's not how it seems to work um a second question is um how to assess reforms how to tell whether something is a good tactic a good strategy a good next step um whether you know and how to assess it against a vision for the world that we actually believe in a vision for the world that's a uh, a world without war, a world without exploitation of the climate, a world without ex exploitation of laborers, like how to actually have um, a world without prisons, how to have an assessment of that. Um, and also how to deal with the with the with um, what people call the NGOization of our movements or the ways that our movements have become um, have turned to the form of the NGO and that has consolidated leadership and given elites more power and given funders a lot of decision-making power, how to deal with that, that reality that we have, these NGOs that kind of tend to hold power and take up 
a lot of um, our, at least our imaginative space about what advocacy or activism looks like. So I wanted to share a few related tools. Um, so one thing that I've thought about a lot is what are the criteria we can use to assess reforms? Um, so most of the time that I've been um, doing this work, I've kind of used four main criteria to figure out like, is this actually going to change things for us or is this um, building more of the same? So one criteria that we always ask is, is this going to provide material relief to people who are like suffering the worst harms? For example, an initial move that um, politicians and institutional leaders often want is they just want to add an anti-discrimination law or policy or a statement. But most of the time we find that that doesn't do anything at all. Like they're not enforced. Um, they don't, uh, people who are, who are, who are suffering the worst experiences of discrimination don't have advocacy. There's no way to prove it. I mean, all of those things. And so we found that one question of just like, is this going to change things materially or does this just make the system look good because it, Put our name on it right like it says it protects us but nothing's changed about who it harms that's like the fundamental first question does it provide material relief if it doesn't provide material relief we should at least focus our efforts on something that does since our communities are actually really like suffering and dying from these conditions the second thing we ask is does it leave people out like a lot of times our reform is structured to lead to, to only capture those who are already the most um, enfranchised in the system. So for example, um, in the US, there's often proposals to change immigration law to make it um, a little less harsh, but only if you don't have a criminal record and um, if you uh, you know can get certain kinds of jobs. Like all, it's always for the people who are in the top layer of the affected group that get kind of scooped up. And so we ask, who's if a reform leaves people out, if it says you can get relief, but not if you have a criminal record, you can get relief, but not if you don't have immigration status, you can get relief, but it won't work for low wage workers. It's only going to work for workers in corporations who have, who are, they can maybe do more to prove discrimination because they have more documentation of what their job duties were. If it only works for a small group or if it explicitly leaves some group out, then we don't want it because um, it usually is then reinforcing the same stigmatization and exploitation of the most vulnerable people and strengthening the overall system by making a few people at the top into what some people call like junior partners of the existing system, right? So we don't want things that divide our group by between those who are more deserving and those who are less deserving, right? This will work for trans people who have documentation, or this will work only for trans people who are passing as the new gender, or this will only work for gay and lesbian people if they're in a married like relationship, right? We don't want, um, we don't want things that leave out the most vulnerable people. The third criteria I often use is does this tactic or reform legitimize or expand the existing systems that we're trying to dismantle? So the best example of this in the U S context is hate crime laws, hate crime laws in the U S add punishing power, um, so like if I can prove that you attacked me because I'm trans or because I'm gay or whatever, um, then, you know, you might get a higher sentence in prison. So they add power to the prosecutor and to the prison and police systems, but they don't do anything to prevent my death or my atta the attack on me. Um, and, you know, what we found in the U.S. is that the policing and prison systems are actually the biggest source of violence against LGBT people. So if we're adding anything to their arsenal, we're not actually um, reducing the harm in our lives. So we don't want to do anything that makes that system look more legitimate or actually expands it. We also don't want to um, do things that endorse it, right, that make it seem like the police exist to help gay people. Like, oh, they're going to have a gay, they're going to hire gay police. Like that, all of that stuff um, um, expands and legitimizes that system using our struggles, but doesn't provide us with relief. And the last thing I always ask is, is the way that we're going about getting this reform mobilizing more people for ongoing struggle? Is it mobilizing the most affected people for long-term particip participation in the movement? Because we don't, you know, there's, I think the other thing about nonprofits is there, or NGOs is they're encouraged to just look for like 
little piecemeal solutions where only some elites get together and think of a good idea, but we don't see actually like like what we need for all of our struggles for justice. One, we need our struggles for justice to be tied together, right? The struggle for workers, the struggle for women, the struggle against colonialism, the struggle for the environment, all of these have to be tied together. And we need to mobilize ourselves and each other for long-term struggle for the things we want that are like not just around the corner. So the, so one question we can always ask is how are we winning this reform? Is Are we winning it through a couple people behind closed doors making a deal? Or are we winning it through lots of people getting lots of skills, building lots of relationships and being ready for the next fight and the next fight? I wanted to share a couple other um, thinkers whose criteria I also have kind of added to my thinking in recent years. One thinker is this guy named Peter Gelderloos. He wrote a book I really love called How Nonviolence Protects the State. And another book more recently called The Failure of Nonviolence. I recommend his work. It's really interesting. But he kind of created a similar, in his more recent book, a similar kind of criteria list. And he had some interesting ones. One is he asked, does this, cri this, does this tactic spread its ideas in a participatory way? So not like, have you heard of it on social media? But like, did this method or this gathering or this... Um, um, approach actually lead to people like starting their own groups in their own towns, like starting their own chapters. Like I often use the example of the Black Lives Matter movement. Like people like started their own groups and lots of people who'd never been active before became active and stayed active. Like how did, did, did it build participation? I think that's a good way for us to evaluate our strategies. He also asks whether it, whether a tactic seizes space for new social relations. So he looks at like the M15 movement in Spain and the Occupy movement in the US and other movements that have been based in being publicly outside where people for the first time in their lives made decisions by consensus in a group having never done that, right? Like most people work in jobs where there's a boss and go to a school where there's a principal or a head teacher and be in families where there's a father. Like most of us have not gotten to be in groups where we actually created horizontal decision-making spaces. So that's an example of practicing new social relations. Or when these groups have taken public squares in different countries in the last many years, they've actually, like, people have lived together and shared food and shared shelter. Like, so those are the questions kind of that I think we could ask about mobilization. Like, is it creating new social relations? Are we getting to be skilled as new kinds of people by doing this work? Or are we still being just made into neoliberal subjects, right? Like, how do we... Um, how are we getting resistant ways of being with each other? He also asks, does it have elite support? And this is a really powerful question because he says, if it has elite support, it's probably going to declare a false victory, right? The systems we have now want to say, oh yeah, we included gay people. Oh yeah, we included trans people. Oh yeah, we took care of violence against women. They want to constantly say, we already did that. It's done. And then, you know, vote for me, right? Or whatever, buy my product. Um, and so how do we recognize um, that things that have elite backing may actually be things we should be suspicious of? I think that's a very bold um, suggestion he makes. Like, it's pretty mind-blowing because oftentimes activist groups are looking for elites to support their work. One other um, thinker I want to bring into this who's uh, similarly gives us some very pragmatic criteria is a really amazing prison abolitionist, activist, and writer, Miriam Kaba. Um, Miriam Kaba wrote this great article about how we should evaluate police reforms because we're living in this period in the U.S. where there's all this movement about trying to reform the police. And she was like, how do we know what's a good one and what's not? And she just offered some very interesting criteria. She said, does it add any money to policing? Does it add more police or more policing? So we might say, oh, they're going to hire trans cops. No, we don't want that. That add, that adds more police, right? Um, they're gonna add. A, they're gonna add two days of training on LGBT issues for the police. It's it's more money and more time for the police. So, you know, if, if our goal is to break down and and dismantle policing in the United States, that wouldn't be fortuitous. She says, "Is it a strictly technical solution? Because if so, it's not good." So, adding body cameras to police. Um, uniforms, right? It's been it's been shown that it's usually used against the people that the police are are harming. It's and the, it's never used against the police, right? So she is very suspicious of anything that's just like technical solutions. When the the nature of policing in the United States is so racist and so classist and sexist and ableist and homophobic and transphobic, we're not going to fix it with a piece of technology. Finally, she asks, is it about 
um, creating individual dialogues with individual police, right? It's this kind of classic liberal narrative that we could just, if, if they only knew, if we just, if we just inform the police, instead of in identifying the real nature of policing as something that upholds capitalism, white supremacy, and colonialism. So I love her questions because they're really practical. They're the kinds of things we could ask about other things too, not just the police. That's just the example she's using. Um, so I want to kind of wrap up by talking a little bit about some of the strategies that I see people using on the ground, given this kind of thinking. One key piece of the work that people are doing that I think is vital is um, the dismantling work, right? The work that we're doing um, that's about taking apart the systems that we see harming people in our lives. So that could be the work we're doing to stop new jails and prisons from being built, to build campaigns around that or to stop new surveillance technologies from coming in to you know, the police or into the immigration enforcement, um, to stop new things from being criminalized or new additional criminal penalties from being added that are just going to grab the same people in our society and not actually make any of us safer, um, to stop new police precincts from being built. All of that work that's about dismantling a system that is really devouring LGBT people. I think that work is really vital. Um, and also to stop that stuff from growing because it's also we're often also kind of beating it back from growing. The second piece of the work um, is work about politi politicized survival work, right? Some people call this mutual aid work, right? Work in which we are trying to help figure out how to support people in our community to get by. And this work often falls away in the context of NGOs. NGOs are encouraged to like win a big case and have it be on the cover of the newspaper or like change a law, but they often don't do that much to actually help people who are like right now don't have a place to live or right now they're getting harassed by the police or right now they're being, they, they don't have help with childcare or healthcare or they're being harmed at school. So the work that we want to do is work that's from a politicized perspective, right? So I'm not sure how this looks where you are, but in the U.S. there's a really problematic history and current reality of the concept of charity. The idea of charity is like, historically, it was like a Christian thing. It was like, you pay for other people, you, you give money to the poor so you can go to heaven. Or now it's often, you know, corporations give money for something related to a social issue so they can like get good public relations, right? Charity is often delivered in a way that's very hierarchical and depoliticized. It says, um, you know, people can come here to get help around housing and then they, and then you come and you they say, well, you have to take these drug tests. And so we can see whether or not you're um, addicted and you need to be on, you need to get, go to these appointments with a mental health counselor and you need to go to anger management. Basically you're, you're homeless because there's something wrong with you as opposed to you're homeless because there's something wrong with a capitalist housing economy. Right? So mutual aid is the reverse of that. It says there's something wrong with the system and we need to help people in it survive right now. And it's a participatory engagement with that system. It's right to support people getting through. It's right to know they're the experts in kind of how the system isn't working. Um, so it's not kind of top down, educated people reaching down to like poor people. You know, it's not that charity model or that social services model. It's a model based on um, participatory, politicized opposition to contemporary conditions. Um, and it's a really vital model for um, for having more people get involved in movement, right? Because when I talk about mutual aid projects, most of them are not funded, right? They're, um, it's all of us getting together and saying that we are going to do a jail support project. We are going to wait outside the jail and anybody who comes out, we're going to see if they need rides. We're going to see if they need to use a phone to call family members. We're going to see if they um, have a place to go and try to provide them what we can. Or it's a child care project. We're going to provide child care so that people with kids can go to political meetings or go to work or whatever. Or it's court support. We're going to go with people and turn out in large numbers to support people who are being put through the criminal process. Um, or it's accompaniment. Like there's a project in Tennessee that where um, people can volunteer to just go with trans people to health care appointments because so many trans people are afraid to go to health care appointments and they get discriminated against in health care appointments. So just having someone go with you. Projects that are about identifying like common places where people are experiencing harm, violence, or lack of what they need and, and accompanying people and being there with them or advocating with them. Or, you know, maybe it's that we're going to provide transportation to people with disabilities. Maybe it's that we're going to do car share and provide transportation to visit family members in prison because the prison's really far away from the city where most of the prisoners' families are. 
anything that's about building the capacity of our movements to meet the needs of people to survive and be connected and be in community, all of that is building new social relations. And it also is a really great way for people to plug in and be politicized, right? And like become part of an activist project that's doing something real and then learn about more and more and more issues and be able to be at the ready for resistance on any of those issues. Um, this is also a part of the sort of the third piece of work. The third piece of the work is really building the world we actually want to live in, right? We live under these brutal conditions. A lot of them are based on, you know, the government and corporations provide these systems and tell us that they're going to provide us with safety through the police and prisons or through the military or that they're going to provide us with economic security through a capitalist economy that exploits people um, and that, you know, um, allows corporations to extract more and more wealth. Um, so the question is, what systems are we going to create that we think work better, that actually do provide safety, that actually do provide people with the things they need? And so part of that is through mutual aid projects, figuring out how to actually provide each other with what we need and get by and survive. And a lot of it is also coming up with alternative systems. A big example of this in the U.S. is that because the policing system is so, so brutal and dangerous and calling the police um, is so dangerous for people, especially people who are targets. Um, but there is a lot of violence in our communities. There's a lot of domestic violence, especially, and interpersonal violence between people who know each other. And so there's been a lot of work to create programs and approaches for what can you do instead of calling the police when harm happens in your community. Some of those are about... Um, reconciliation processes and rest restoration and transformation processes, bringing together people who've done harm, people who've been harmed and their communities to see what needs to happen to make the harm not happen again and to make the person who was harmed have an opportunity to be safe and heal. Some of those are prevention projects, like making sure people have rides or making sure that people have other places to go um, if they're facing violence in their house um, so that they can actually leave, right? Like looking at what would help people be safer. Um, so there's a range of different projects, but the idea of actually creating an alternative system since the one we have we know doesn't work. This is happening a lot in the U.S. right now around disaster relief because there's so many storms and flooding and fires all this result of um, severe climate change um, things happening uh, produces, you know, enormous need. And of course, the government doesn't show up, right? Like the government is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So people are creating a lot of alternative systems based in um, disaster relief uh, that are about recognizing that the government is not going to show up and saying, OK, how do we create disaster preparedness ahead of time? which also builds relationships. How, what if we knew all our neighbors? What if we all talked about whether or not we have stored water? What if we figured out, okay, you live in an apartment, but I live in a, in a house. I, I can put the water for, for all of us in my basement. Like, What if we actually built that level of community care and support? And how might that also protect us from violence right now, help us if the police or immigration come now, if we actually had those relationships? And also just building an alternative, something that doesn't work because the government does not work with regard to disaster relief. So those three pieces, um, politicized survival strategies, um, dismantling the systems that we have now, and building the new systems, I would say are three big categories of work we do that are way beyond the fantasy of trying to get the existing systems to like recognize us and say that LGBT people are good. Like that doesn't get us anything, and it gets them a lot, right? Like, like you see like President Obama, for example, he worked so hard to change his public image. He was doing all of this very regressive conservative stuff in reality, right? He was expanding the troops in Afghanistan. He was containing, continuing to have Guantanamo Bay open. He, you know, was the biggest, most deporting president of the United States ever. He deported more people and built the immigration system to be much more large and much more harsh. He was president of the most imprisoning country in the world. He needed to hide that and appear progressive. And he did that by saying he was like pro-gay marriage. Right. So that's a very common thing right now is that this kind of fake progressive, um, we call it pinkwashing, um, like this fake progressive um, veneer is put on institutions and politicians um, using LGBT issues. And it doesn't really benefit LGBT people because it's usually just symbolic stuff um, and it doesn't move us towards what we want, which is we want actual progressive change, like actual radical change to get people who are suffering um, poverty immigration enforcement, criminalization, violence, like all of that. Um, we want the real answers to that, not just like slap a rainbow flag on it, you know? Um, 
So um, I feel like I'm running out of time. I guess I'll just say, um, you know, part of this has that's been really important is because we have a critique of, of the nonprofit structures and the ways that they are very hierarchical and the ways that they um, are very undemocratic, we've been really working to create organizations that operate horizontally and as collectives and that are about having lots of people getting to make decisions. Um, a lot of the models we use for that come from Latin America. I'm happy to share resources um, afterwards. If people want to email with me, I can share more details. And there's a lot of stuff on my website about some of these themes. Um, we're interested in making membership-based groups where there's lots and lots of people involved who make decisions together instead of just a few people make decisions and all you can do is give money or not. Like that's the only way to be involved. Um, in general, we're looking for mass participation, right? And we're looking for ways for people to get, to build solidarity in um, on issues beyond what they already know about. Um, and to really be networked together in a, in, in real left community. Um, my final notes. Um, yeah, I, I think this work is really hard. It's really, it was really interesting to read about the context you all are in and see that there are many overlaps, especially overlaps around, um, a strong right-wing conservative voice that it's easy to just be reacting to. You know, we see that with Donald Trump, right? He said trans people can't serve. He tweeted trans people can't serve in the military. And then as a result, all these people were like, this is terrible. Serving the military is so important and wonderful. It's like, that's, that's reactive. That's not actually our message, right? Transphobia is wrong. And U S militarism is wrong. How do we build campaigns and work that represents our actual views and not just a reaction to um, right-wing framings. I think that's a real struggle that's being faced um, in many places in the world right now. Um, obviously, it's, you know, it's different in each place, but it's interesting to see how different activists are trying to build models of that. I'm so sorry I can't be with you to, to actually have this conversation in person, but I hope at some point we will find ways to connect and, um, and, and folks have my email. So if, if, uh, if I can provide um, you know, reading resources, videos, lots of resources about all the things I've shared here that might be useful um, or interesting for your discussions. I'm, I'm so happy to, and I'm really grateful for all the work you're doing. And I look forward to hearing how the meeting goes and what you all um, think about and come to together. Um, and I really appreciate your work.